Hello, welcome back to Big Al Books. I clearly got a new chair here and I'm excited to use it. I also got a new computer and that's why I haven't been filming videos in the past few months, but I did invest in a new laptop, so I am back to making some videos, hopefully, and I hope that you've been doing really well since the last time that we spoke. I've been doing great. I am back at school now, a new school year has begun, but I had a really fantastic summer of reading. In fact, I read an entire shelf of books, which is too many to talk about in one video, but I did want to try to capture some of the reading that I've done this summer. So I've put together a list. These are the books that just really felt the most summary to me. Like these are the books that I really feel like I read at the right place and at the right time. And if you are also someone who enjoys reading with the seasons, then you might enjoy hearing my list as well. I would love to hear from you what your idea of a perfect summer read is. For me, it is a book that demands me to take it outside to read. So during the summer, I try to do most of my reading outside on my balcony. And that to me is a perfect summer book that you can grab an iced drink and set up outside, look at the trees, feel the breeze as you are transported to some preferably hot setting. These are my peak summer reads. So to start off this list, I did want to include one book that I read back in June. To me, true summer is July and August when I'm off on summer vacation, but this poetry anthology is just too good to pass up. So I did want to put this on your radar for sure. Um, this is called When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. And this is a poetry anthology that was edited by Joy Harjo, although there were many other iconic Indigenous poets working on this collection as well. And as you can see, this is a pretty chunky anthology. It's around 450 pages. And my favorite thing about this is that the poems are arranged by geographic location. So it's almost like you're going on this road trip of Turtle Island to different places and seeing how poetry has kind of changed and developed and grown from that area. So the poems are arranged, again, by location, but also chronologically. So it was cool to see some voices from the past, as well as getting to hear from some more contemporary poets as well. And there are just so many amazing poets represented in this collection. Again, I really love how the poems were grouped together in this collection because you can see certain features of the land that these authors are writing about. You can see their connection to the place that they're from, but there is this common theme of displacement through a lot of these poems. So you can see how colonization has affected different generations of Indigenous poets. You have some poets in here who are firsthand residential school survivors, but then you also have more contemporary poets who are writing about the experience of being disconnected from your language or your culture or responding to stereotypes and pushing back against what people expect you to be like as an Indigenous person. So while each author really brought their own authentic voice to their poetry, it was also cool to see some of the common themes and threads being explored um, through poets of different ages from different places. So this is such an incredible anthology. There is so much beauty within these pages, so much pain and so much power. I highly recommend this one. Next on my list is Barbarian Days, A Surfing Life by William Finnegan. This is the only nonfiction book on my list. I think everything else that I want to talk about is a novel, but this is a memoir and I will always strongly associate this as a summer book because I exclusively read this book when I was at the beach and I could hear the sound of some waves because I really wanted to go to that atmosphere. So this is very clearly about William's experiences as a surfer. What's interesting is that he was a journalist and like a war reporter. So he had this really interesting career as a writer, but this book doesn't really get too much into all of that. This is mostly centered around his lifelong passion for surfing. So it's really cool in this book that you get to kind of follow William's life. He takes you in the early chapters, how he learned how to surf as a boy living in Hawaii. And he then 
becomes a bit more ambitious as he grows up. He starts wanting to travel the world to find some more obscure and elite surfing spots. And then he ends the book as he's kind of aging and he's not necessarily able to accomplish the feats that he used to um, as a younger surfer. So it's, it's really cool to see someone have a lifelong passion for something and to see how that's impacted their life in a lot of ways. Surfing is a sport that I find fascinating because it does take this really intense stamina to succeed at it and it is really demanding physically but it's also not like other sports. It does seem to have this very individualistic mentality at the heart of it and this book also explores how much surfing has changed as a pastime um, over the course of the 20th century and beyond. You know it used to be something that um, you really could only do if you lived by a coast and even then it was rare for people to get into surfing but now it's definitely a sport that has grown a lot in popularity even though you know there are only a limited number of really great surf breaks in the world. So I loved getting to learn more about the sport but I also just really loved how William told his story. This book is so descriptive and you know in theory it should get boring to read about surfing because you're kind of like repeating the same action again and again. Like you only think that hearing about traveling through a wave can be interesting so many times but I was really never bored while I was reading this. He always had a specific reason for why he was trying to tell his story and a certain emotion that he was trying to convey that was also connected to where he was in his life as a person and his development. So I really didn't find this book boring. I think what also helped is again I would only read this book when I was at the beach. So it was only, you know, over a handful of sittings, but I think it helped to be immersed in that kind of environment and spacing out my readings of this book. Um, I did look forward uh, to picking it up each time and seeing where he was going to travel and what kind of scrapes he was going to get into. So even though I am not someone who would normally pick up any kind of sports memoir, I have to say this one was well worth the read. It was poetic. It was evocative. It really helps you understand the mindset of why anyone would want to engage in such a grueling kind of sport and you know it does make me sad that I don't live anywhere near a coast. I will never become a great surfer but that is the magic of books you know you can vicariously try to experience someone else's um, adventures and I did love that about picking this one up at the beach. Okay, next up I want to talk about three novels that I found were perfect summer reads. I would not have wanted to read these at any other time in the year. And these are all by authors who I have previously read before and I've enjoyed them so I was excited to checking out more of their work this summer. So let's talk about them. Um, the first one is The English Patient by Michael Ondaatje. This is just kind of a famous one um, especially in the world of Canadian literature and typically I'm not drawn to historical fiction set during the Second World War. I just feel like that's a time period that I've read about a lot and I feel like it's hard to do something new and imaginative with that time period. I also had some preconceived notions that this was going to be some kind of overblown romantic love story and I have to say I am glad that I didn't let either of those two things stop me from picking this book up and I mostly picked it up because I truly loved In the Skin of a Lion um, by Ondaatje and I knew that this book came afterwards and followed some of the characters who we were introduced to from that book. But I'm so glad I gave this book a chance because I thought it was a fantastic read and there are a few of this book's settings that seem very suitable for the summertime. So as you can see from the cover here we've got lots of action in the desert uh, in North Africa happening in this book um, as well as there's a story that's happening in an abandoned villa in Italy 
kind of towards the end of the Second World War. So we've got some shifting timelines in this one. So the main character here, uh, who's known as the English patient, has suffered from a plane crash where his helmet went on fire and most of his face has burned off and he doesn't really have a strong sense of identity. He doesn't exactly know what his name is. And this book is kind of learning about who this guy is. Um, he has a nurse that has decided to take care of him and she wants to stay in this abandoned villa and then as the story goes on uh, a few more people show up at the villa and they form this almost strange little found family of people who have all been heavily traumatized by their experiences in the war and they're all traumatized in completely different ways. Um, it's not just the story that, you know, we've seen a lot of times of people who have been scarred from their active combat. Um, these are all people who have been scarred mentally and emotionally um, in all sorts of different ways who've been caught up in the crossfires of these conflicts. And we get to see them trying to heal together um, in a sense. And part of that is really telling their stories and trying to figure out and process what it was that happened to them and to see if they can love again or form new connections. And it sounds like that's kind of cheesy, but I feel like this book is, is a lot more than that. It really looks deeply at how a global catastrophe like a war just completely rips lives apart and it's really messy trying to put them back together. So yes, in a sense, there are these kind of sweeping romantic plot lines and stories, but I really loved how messy this book is and the kind of questions that it's interrogating. And I did watch the film version as well. And I have to say like the film did not do the book justice at all. And I actually felt like they had like very different messages also, the film version cuts out most of the storyline for Kip, who is one of the central characters in this, who's working as a sapper trying to defuse bombs throughout the war. And learning about his job and like the psychological <laughs> games that bomb makers play uh, was truly fascinating. And he was just one of the greatest characters. So if you've only seen the film, you really don't know Kip. Um, so I would recommend checking out the book uh, for sure. It's a devastating read, but it is a remarkable one as well. I'm also so glad that I picked up another book by Deborah Levy this summer. Uh, this is Swimming Home. It's a really short read. I think I maybe read it in a day because I couldn't really put it down. And Deborah Levy is one of those authors, like the more of her books I read, the more I appreciate her and what she's trying to do as an author. And I think this is maybe my favorite of her three novels that I've read so far. Um, this one has, first of all, perfect vibes for the summer. This is set in the south of France and two families are renting a vacation house together. And then one day this mysterious woman shows up like floating in the pool and they think that she's dead and they pull her out and they try to figure out what's happening. And she is this very strange botanist named Kitty and they end up allowing her to stay with them. So of course she is going to completely disrupt the order of the vacation and the relationships um, between everyone in these two families. The atmosphere in this book is just engrossing and it is definitely not the kind of vacation where everybody is going to relax and have a good time. Like this is an ominous book. It is very menacing and, and the tension between the characters is so palpable and it really builds up to this intense place uh, by the end of the book. But something that I really loved that this book did was really blowing up the trope of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl because uh, the father of one of the families, Joe, is a writer and he's kind of struggling with depression and you think that Kitty's going to enter his life as this kind of Manic Pixie Dream Girl figure who is going to recharge him. You know, they're going to fall in love in some way and he's going to start seeing all of the beauty around him or at least want to become a more kind of creative and carefree person. But instead, it's kind of the opposite. Like, what if instead of making you feel more alive, the Manic Pixie Dream Girl is instead trying to make you feel like you should embrace death? I'm not going to say more than that, <laughs> but I really enjoyed seeing the reversal of that trope in this novel. So this was just a delicious read for a perfect, sultry summer afternoon. Um, another perfect 
summer afternoon kind of book was The Bay of Noon by Shirley Hazard. And I first read Shirley Hazard last summer in August when I picked up The Transit of Venus. So I think she is an author who I associate with the kind of hot summer days. And The Bay of Noon was a perfect and like gorgeous summer book. And Shirley Hazard just does not miss. This book really has cemented her as just one of my all-time favorite authors. She is so perceptive in the way that she writes people and dialogue and she really just cuts through the illusions of people and their personalities in such a ferocious kind of way. This book is set in Naples which was another good summer setting and we're from the perspective of Jenny who I believe is British although she's grown up in different parts of the world and so she's kind of an outsider and she's trying to observe the Italian character from various people that she's meeting. She's basically trying to make friends with this Italian couple, observing their relationship, um, while also kind of getting in her own strange relationship with a Scottish guy that she works with. So this is really a novel where like, <laughs> there's not a lot of plot. It's not exciting um, in terms of what's happening. But you don't need that always in a summer read. Sometimes the vibes are enough to just carry you on. Um, and everything just seems fascinating. Every conversation that she has, every car ride or sightseeing trip that she goes on um, is all part of developing the relationships between these characters and we see how connected they all are and what they need to teach each other in a way. So certain things that they are missing that they're looking for um, in other people. So I really loved this protagonist who is really feeling like she is not really worthy of the friendships of the people that are trying to befriend her and, you know, feeling like an outsider in the place where she's living. So it's a really great character study and just a gorgeous book to lose yourself in on a hot summer day. So I'm really glad I picked this one up. It also gets like surprisingly heavy at the end. So it does really build up to an emotional place uh, for the end of the book. And then moving on into some more international books, I guess. Um, typically in summers past, I have tried to read a lot of South American literature. And I did try to read some more again this summer, but the only South American read that I really ended up enjoying this summer was A House in the Country by the Chilean author Jose Donoso. And this was translated by David Pritchard. Yes. This book is an interesting one because it is truly grotesque and disturbing. It's exploring corruption in Chile. So this book is allegorical. So it's set in this mansion, as you can see here, uh, this estate out in the countryside, uh, surrounded by this big fence, which as you can see here is somewhat ruptured on the cover, which should point to events to come. Um, it's a truly large, wealthy family that is inhabiting this summer home. And one day the adults all decide to go for a picnic and they pack up all of their carriages and they take all of the servants with them. And this leaves all of the children to kind of do their own thing at the mansion and they kind of run wild. And there are, I think 33 cousins, something like that. You can see um, there's a pretty extensive <laughs> family chart here so you can keep track of who's who in this book. So, of course, this book is speaking to military dictatorships uh, in Chile. Um, it's looking at the corruption of the aristocracy, as well as the chaos that ensues when people try to take over a government and run a country with all sorts of different um, opinions and philosophies. So this book is, again, it's very violent and it's very disturbing and grotesque because, you know, those are all horrible things that have impacted a lot of people. So this is definitely not like a fun, relaxing beach read for the summer, but it still does feel like a summer book. Um, as you can tell with the setting, it takes place during those decadent late summer days where there's almost this sweltering atmosphere that's preventing people from really thinking clearly. So I think that's part of what allows this mania to overtake all of the members of this family to just go completely nuts, <laughs> these children on their own in this house. 
Um, this book also has a lot of commentary on colonization in Chile, um, as this family has pretty much mostly amassed their wealth from exploiting indigenous peoples of the land and forcing them to work in their silver mine. So um, I really appreciated how much commentary Donoso has in this book, while also telling an engaging story about these really twisted cousins. And then there were these interesting um, meta sections to the narrative as well that I thought was engaging. The narrator does often remind us of his presence, that he is a narrator who is making up the story and making choices and creating these characters. Um, there's this scene towards the end of the book where the narrator meets one of the characters from this family um, at a bar and they kind of talk about his story and the character is telling him how like he really got the family wrong and he's like exaggerating everything. So I really liked those meta elements to the story as well and it has me quite intrigued with Donoso as an author. Um, I've heard the obscene Bird of Night is probably even more twisted than this one. I'm having a bit of a hard time tracking down an affordable copy of that book. Unfortunately a lot of his work doesn't seem to be in print which is a shame because he certainly is a bold South American writer with a lot of provocative ideas who writes sharp social commentary. So this is quite a memorable read and to be honest it made me feel grateful that I grew up in a smaller family and that I didn't have 30 cousins to go running around with getting into big trouble during my summer vacations when I was growing up. So at the start of the summer, I thought I would read a lot of South American literature this summer, but actually the part of the world that I found myself the most drawn to reading about was the Caribbean. So I read four Caribbean novels and I loved all of them. Like they were all really cool, interesting reads. So I'll talk about these four next uh, in the order that I read them. So the first one here is Sirius Blooms at Night, and this is by Shani Mutu. She was born in Ireland, but was raised in Trinidad. She now lives in Canada. I first heard about this book when it was referenced in the subtweet by Vivek Shreya, and two of the main characters bond over their shared connection with this book, and they both really feel like the representation in this book speaks to them and their identity. So this is a cult classic or modern classic that um, I've really wanted to check out for a long time, and I'm so glad that I got to it this summer. I mean, first of all, the island setting here is just so lush. Like, as you can see from the cover, we are in a world that is just teeming with flowers and plants and trees and even insects are featured quite prominently. Like, this island is just really full of life and nature in so many forms. In some ways it's beautiful, in some ways it's kind of overwhelming. So, summer again was the perfect time to pick this one up. It is a very intense story though that will take quite an emotional toll on you as a reader. Um, it's following the life of Mala Remchandin and her life story is harrowing in a lot of ways. So the earlier part of the book gives some more context into her family. She is raised in an incredibly dysfunctional family setting with an abusive father. But then also a lot of the book is set in this kind of present story where we meet Mala as an old woman. And basically she has been accused of this crime and everyone believes that she's a murderer, but she is also a very old woman. And most people think that she's kind of lost her mind and she's senile and she's not really capable of communicating with people. So she's just put into this home for the elderly. And there's just one nurse who has really decided to connect with Mala and to care for her and to treat her like a human being. And a lot of this book is about the relationship that these two build together. And Tyler was a really engaging narrator for parts of this book uh, because she is trying to figure out her gender identity identity as well throughout this book. So this book has to do a lot with transformation and identity and how people perceive you and view you as one kind of thing, but you might be something completely different, um, how you know yourself to be. And the self can always be changing throughout life. So I think the title of the book is getting this idea of how, you know, flowers can be at their most powerful and their most beautiful at night in these darkest of times. So even though these characters face some very severe traumas and obstacles, 
they are still able to continue growing and expanding as people. So that's why Mala made for a really fascinating protagonist of this story. Um, even though you do think at first like she's this powerless old woman who's so disconnected from everything, but you actually see that there's a lot more going on and people have their own ways of processing their traumas. So again, a really powerful, emotional read, but also a really rich character study with a lush island setting, which made for quite an unforgettable novel. Then moving over to Jamaica, this is The Marvelous Equations of the Dread, a novel in base rhythm by Marcia Douglas. And this is a fantastical novel that is kind of all over the place through space and time. It sort of surrounds the spirit of Bob Marley after his death. He is trying to get into paradise and he ends up coming back, his spirit at least, to earth and he inhabits the body of a homeless man named Falldown who lives in a clock tower. And he kind of has a mission. There's something that he has to do with the limited time that he has remaining to him um, on the earth. And I won't say much more than that. I found this book to be a very transportive read. So first of all, there's the musical style of the prose. As the title suggests, it is kind of written in this rhythmic style. I've heard the audiobook is actually a fantastic way to read it. So first of all, it does have this kind of like lilt to it. Um, and I actually found this really great reggae DJ set to listen to while I was reading this book that also really helped bring me uh, into the atmosphere. Um, so you do get the sense of Jamaica while you're reading this book um, from the past as well through to more contemporary times. It reminded me of A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James and I actually really wanted to pick up that book after reading this one uh, to see these two in dialogue with each other because they're both really showing how Bob Marley is a lot more than just a pop singer, you know, in the history of Jamaica. Like he was a major player in terms of Jamaican culture. And especially this book is looking at Rastafarianism and the origins of that and some of the key spiritual beliefs there and how it can be used to build connections between people and looking to like prosper in the afterlife. So this book really taught me a lot about a lot of things. Again, because it's just taking you to so many different places and times and voices. Like it really is this kind of beautiful polyphonic book. So if you're looking for an immersive Jamaican read, this one was quite fascinating. And again, perfect for a hot summer day. And then the next one I read was Lucy by Jamaica Kincaid. This one is not set in the Caribbean, but it is featuring a girl who is moving from the West Indies to America. Lucy is just a fascinating exploration of perspective because our main character, Lucy, is trying to take in and understand this entirely new worldview as she's working as a nanny for this rich couple in the city. So she really doesn't understand their ways at the start of the book. And there are so many things that she finds bewildering or just confusing. Even something like looking at a flower. The woman that she works for thinks that like going to see the daffodils is like this beautiful, nice thing to do on a spring day. And Lucy can look at a flower and hate it. So, you know, these two women can see the same thing and have totally different experiences. So it was just a really neat story to be in the mind of someone who thought so differently. And Lucy is kind of brash and she has strong emotions and she's not afraid to be angry and to express those. But she also does go through a lot of growth um, throughout this book where she does find this deeper sense of empathy to understand the people that she's working for. Um, and also she's going out and creating her own relationships. So this is another book that's on the shorter side, but I feel like it actually accomplishes so much and it's able to build like such a deep, memorable character. So um, this was another one that I was really glad that I checked out and I will need to read more Jamaica Kincaid uh, to come in the future. And then the final Caribbean novel I picked up was for Women in Translation Month in August, and that was The Bridge of Beyond by Simone Schwartz Bart. And she's an author who was originally born in France, but then moved to Guadalupe as she was growing up. And this book also has that kind of enchanting island feel to it. 
This is exploring multiple generations of women uh, from the same family. This book is a beautiful novel in a lot of ways, but it is really exploring hardships and heartache. And it's showing the profound impact that slavery has, particularly for the women who are living on this island. And it shows us women from different generations. But even though as the generations become a bit more further removed from slavery, they are all still scarred by that experience. So needless to say, there is a lot of pain and suffering in this book. It might be a beautiful setting, but there have been some harrowing things um, that have happened on this island. So this is mostly following the story of Telume, um, a young girl who is being raised by her grandmother. Again, the earlier parts of the book are, are kind of getting into stories of, of other members of her family, but it is this coming of age tale where she starts to explore who she is, what she wants to do with her life, um, as well as her experiences with falling in love. And ultimately she learns that romantic love is not really enough uh, to save her in this life. And there was something that was so ominous about this book with how the women in the village are constantly reminding each other that for every happiness that you achieve, that kind of means that there's going to be a sorrow that will come from it later on. They are always reminding each other that, you know, misfortune is always kind of around the corner. And if you're beautiful now, it just means that it will all lead to ugliness in the end. You can see that it's a community that is really affected by this worldview of the kind of necessity of evil and just being prepared for fate to strike you in many kind of severe ways. And that's sort of the book is like Telame learning how to weather these blows that she will experience throughout her life. So <laughs> this is a, a strange novel in a lot of ways. Like it starts off, like it's really telling you this fairy tale almost, like these stories um, of these people feel like mythical um, and larger than life. But then it does also have this like very real side to it um, of all the pain that these people are experiencing, but how they're still trying to come together as a community uh, to get through it. So this ended up being another book that I was so grateful to get to read this summer. It's a beautiful engrossing story that is also deeply sorrowful and it has truly beautiful writing. So this is one that should not be missed. To close out this video, I wanted to talk about two legendary books that I got to read for the very first time this summer. But I'm going to be honest with you, it's kind of late at night as I'm filming this video and I'm getting pretty tired. So I'm not going to go into too much depth about these books because I know like for sure they're going to be appearing on my year end best books of the year video. So I'll, I'll definitely talk about them more later when I feel like I have more <laughs> stamina to do so. Um, but these two books that I'm alluding to are Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison and Moby Dick by Herman Melville. So I knew I had to tackle these two books this summer because I turned 30 at the end of June and I thought it would be a great way to start off a new decade by reading some legendary fantastic books. And these are books that, yeah, I just, I really felt like I couldn't keep continuing on in life without having read them, if that makes sense. <laughs> and though I wish I had picked them up when I was younger, you know what? The right book finds you at the right time. These were both stunning summer reads. The one I read first was Moby Dick. And this was the first classic that I picked up after turning 30. And this was really something I had been avoiding. For like a long time. You know, unlike Captain Ahab, who actively goes after the whale, I was kind of trying to retreat from the whale. I knew it would be a book that I'd have to read at some point in my life, but I kind of just thought that it was going to be a chore because you hear so many people talk about how boring this book is, which I just don't understand at all. I thought every page of this book was gold in some way. Even the chapters that are just going off about some whale facts. Like Herman Melville has such an engaging style of writing. Like he can make anything seem interesting. And I knew that when I was only a few pages into this book, I was like, okay, he has such a cool style that this is going to be fun. 
And you know, in this book, all of the chapters are pretty short. So there's really no section that you're going to be stuck in for like that long of a time period. And I found that that also helped make the reading experience quicker. Um, I did find that this was a tough book to put down once you get into it. I will say the start of this book isn't particularly summery as we start off on a freezing night in New England while Ishmael is trying to find a place to stay. But once you get into the scenes where you're like on the boat and you're going, um, that really felt summery. This was a perfect book to read on my balcony and, and I could almost feel myself like swaying at some points. Like I, I did feel like I was somehow on the ship with them while also like being very grateful that I was not because it's such a disaster. And I think that's something that makes this book feel very propulsive on your first read through because you very much know that it is a train wreck and you're leading up to some kind of calamity and you can just see all of the clashes and the tensions between the different personalities on this ship. But this book really exceeded my expectations in every way imaginable. Like I wasn't expecting this book to be as funny as it is. Like it had me laughing so many times. Ishmael just had me in stitches with the way that he's describing things. Also Captain Ahab was magnetic. Like he is just a great charismatic cult of personality and any time that he was doing some kind of monologue I was just living my best life. Um, again even those like infamous whaling chapters like it's an interesting world to learn about this former industry that Melville tried to preserve in so much detail and it's a very cruel industry and it's of course this gory and violent book. I was kind of conflicted sometimes reading it, like should I be enjoying a novel like this? Um, do I want to see scenes of like people torturing an animal just trying to live its life? So definitely you know, felt some things while I was reading this book. But overall, I'm so glad that I picked this one up in the summer because I feel like a lot of us are at our most adventurous in the summer. You know, hopefully you're going on a better vacation than the crew of this ship. But it really is this like stunning adventure novel of, you know, how men feel this calling to go out on the high seas and do something wild with their lives. And I feel like this book really captures that seafaring spirit. We are almost going all around the globe <laughs> throughout this book. Um, so this was a fun book to read for the summer and definitely a book that I'm going to continue thinking about for the rest of the year. So really to sum up my first reading experience of Moby Dick, um, I was just so pleasantly surprised with how fun I found this novel to be. Even though it is really serious and you're seeing people really blow up their own lives. Um, but it is a thrilling novel and I can totally see why this book has remained in the cultural conversations. And to close off this video, let's talk about Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. I picked up this one in this new vintage edition. Uh, you can see here they're releasing four of her books in these covers with these black and white photos. I picked this one up not because of the cover but because I wanted to read the introduction by Marlon James who is one of my favorite writers and I heard him talking about this book on his podcast or in an interview or something and he was saying that basically if you haven't read this book you cannot consider yourself to be a serious reader <laughs> and um I had considered myself to be a serious reader. You know, I had read a lot of other Toni Morrison books, but I hadn't read this one. So I thought, you know what? I got to fix this <laughs> in the eyes of Marlon James. I, <laughs> I need to read this book. And I'm really glad that I had that push that I needed to, to pick this one up because it is astounding. And I plan on rereading Beloved this fall uh, because I kind of need to compare the two to see which one I think is her greater novel because they're just both so incredible, incredibly different. Um, 
but I just wasn't expecting, I guess, to enjoy Song of Solomon so much. This is just a rapturous novel, uh, which I should have known because I knew that flight was one of the main themes of this book. The first half of this book makes you feel like you're sitting on a porch getting some really good gossip about this strange family. And you're learning all about the weird things that go on in this house and how no one in this family really understands each other. You know, they live under the same roof, but they all have their own fears and desires and dreams and they can't really see each other in a way. And that's kind of Milkman's story is, is learning to understand the women in his life, particularly, you know, he starts off this book really feeling sorry for himself in a lot of ways. And he doesn't take the time to, to think about those other people that have sacrificed so much for him. Um, and then it's really in the second half of the book where he starts to go on like that journey of self growth. But if the first half of this book feels like you're just gossiping on the porch, the second half feels like you accidentally fell asleep on your porch and you're having a very strange fever dream. <laughs> I really loved the shift in tone um, and I wasn't quite expecting it. Uh, the second half when Milkman travels down to the south to try to find um, more information out about his family, that's where things really get rather strange and uncanny. And again, like how in the first half, Milkman doesn't really understand his family or the women in his life. In the second half of the book, Milkman doesn't really understand people from the South and he has to pay uh, for the consequences of that lack of understanding. The second half of this book is so thrilling and strange. It really feels like you're in a dream, but you just have to know what's going to happen. So it was so incredible to read this book for the first time. And I know again, it's going to be one that I'll need to return to, to really appreciate all of the craft that went into this book and the structure. But I'm glad that I picked this one up during the summer because while I was reading this book, it was really the only thing that I could think about. So it's a good thing that I was on vacation and I had the time to dedicate uh, to reading this book. And and really getting lost in the world that Toni Morrison creates. So those are my top 12, I think, um, books that I read this summer that really captured the essence of summer for me. If you read anything good this summer, I would love to hear about it. I have to start already assembling my to be read list for next summer. I guess it's never too early <laughs> to start. Um, or maybe you live in the Southern Hemisphere and you've had winter and you want to tell me a bit about that. Um, that's also cool too. And thank you for continuing to check out my videos, even though I am not the most frequent uh, with posting on my channel. I really do appreciate everyone who continues to check out my videos um, and leaves me some comments and lets me know how they're doing. So thank you again, take care, and I will see you again in the next one. Bye.